Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Gary A. Swaby, and you're now watching or listening to the Powercast. And on this episode, we will be reviewing uh, Raising Canaan Season 2, Episode 6. And the title of this episode was It's a Business, Man. Um, and I am here with Mr. Richard Bailey Jr. How are you doing, Richard? Doing good, Gary. What's up, listeners and viewers? What's up, indeed? And we are also joined by Miss Dana Abercrombie, who is working very hard right now. Um, how are you, Dana? Hello. I have not slept in days. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Oh, make sure you get some shot eye after this, man. <laughs> but, um, yeah, as you know, people, this is the podcast where you know we go into the most depth. Um, about the, the story of power, you know, every power episode, you know, we get real deep into the story and the writing and everything. Um, so yeah, uh, please, you know, stick, stick, stand by, because we are about to like really go deep with this episode, because uh, I think we all kind of liked it, you know, a lot happened in this episode. And we, we, we got some juicy things to talk about. So I can't wait to get to it. But uh, before we do that, just friendly reminder, you know, make sure you uh, engage with the content. If you enjoy it, you know, send us uh, your comments, your theories, your questions, your critiques, anything you have, you know, drop those comments down below. Uh, you can also rate the podcast on, you know, Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you're listening. Um, and also please do hit the like button. You know, we, we, we're, still, um, we're still thinking about doing a live episode at some point. Um, but, you know, we're, we're going to have to, you know, really see that engagement for us to see that it's worth doing, you know, so please do hit the like button, leave your comments, let us know, you know, you want the live show and everything. And also check out the channel, look at some of the other content there and, and hit the, the like button. Um, you know, Dana has a, an interesting short on the channel right now. It seems like she's been mingling with some celebrities, you know, some, <laughs> some uh, Black Panther people. So... They, they, there it is right there, the X, you know, the Black Panther symbol. Um, so, yeah, you know, check out the content on the channel. Subscribe if you like it and all that good stuff. But, uh, you know, we won't delay the show any further. We're going to get right into the takeaways segment. And in this segment, uh, we each, you know, we go around the, the panel here and we each give three takeaways, you know, things that stood out to us personally from this episode of Raising Canaan. And uh, this week, we are going to Miss Dana Abercrombie first. So, Dana, please hit us with your three takeaways. I'm going to hit you with my best shot. I'm going to fire away. Um, what <laughs> I always start with the quote that always starts the entire show because I feel that that is a theme and it wraps everything up in a bubble. So, yay. Um, basically what they were saying, or what Kanan, adult Kanan, 50 Cent was saying or narrating, was that when the block get hot, people get to narrow, get, oh my God, I can't even read. Basically what he was saying is that people who are already in the game, who are prepared for this, they know not to be scared because fear is always there. And they're basically saying, how are you going to be afraid of the moon when the moon is always there? And so with this episode, it really showed Kanan when from a little boy to now he's a man. We're getting that man like Kanan that we know from the original Power series. And even though it was something minor, it was something major to that next step. The whole situation with the brown paper bag, hence the name, um, he is being taught how to run things from the ground up and something as simple as a bag is still very dangerous. You know, transporting this money with the chance that you know people get robbed in the street and we can also equate it to what's going on right now with pnb rock i believe that's his name and that whole situation so you know just being out there having something on you people are going to know and they rolled up on him with purpose they rolled up on famous canaan happened to just be a stand you know bystander and his bag got stolen as well that had rock's money in it and instead of being a boy and crying to his mother and explaining the situation, kind of what we've seen in the very first episode of um, Raising Canaan. Remember last season when he was a little boy and he was getting beat up and bullied by those guys at the uh, playground? And he told his mom and the mom had to like, you know, you put your rocks in the socks and then you beat them. He 
was his own person with this episode. He did not tell Rock. He may have told Marvin, but you know, we're not going to tell Luke. We're not going to tell her either way. You have to go and be a man about this. And he did. He, with the help of the random woman who was Corinne's mother, and uh, that was something there, but he was able to get the money back. And it showed a fierceness. It wasn't like, here's the gunpoint. I want my money back. Thank you. Have a good day. He really beat Freddie, you know, to a bloody pulp and a mess to a point where I thought he was the one that was dead. I know that was um, Richard teased that someone was dead. I was like, oh, it's Freddie. I don't know why he's really excited for this because I don't even remember Freddie existing. But, uh, you know, he's alive, clearly. But the point is, was his transformation into becoming that man, that, you know, one step. Another one that really made me happy. I love Joey. And to see Mr. Joey of the bad assness come back was just really great for me. Unique is back. And the fact that he set up, he was lying in the dark. You know, he was quiet. I don't want any part of this business anymore. He had his little shop. What was that carpet rug? I don't even know what he sell. But he has his little shop. And, you know, they came to him. Remember, he never approached them at any point after that whole entire situation, but he was smart enough to set up a situation where they would eventually come to him. It was him, remember? Him and Worrell kind of, I'm going to assume, worked off some kind of deal in the in back end part, and that's when it was like, oh, you guys really set this up. So that now Raquel has to reapproach the New Jersey mobsters in order to form this business, but in a way it kind of cuts out Raquel from being a major player. Everything now goes to Unique. He's running everything. Um, so that was really interesting in how Unique was able to step up and really show Raquel, I don't fear you. I may be quiet for that one moment, but I have my pieces in place as well, and I'm gonna come back at you. But also to know that Raquel never backed down. She was, you know, obviously upset about what happened, but she never backed down. She never threw a fit in front of the New Jersey mobsters um, or in front of Unique. But you know that she's planning and she's calculating. And remember, she stated that she wants New Jersey to be the blueprint and that she wants to go more national with this. And when she had the conversation with Cartier, who I'm going to just refer to as Kingpin, because that's Kingpin and Vanessa for me. Um, he was explaining about all the businesses that he does in the South because there's a less of a market. So while we're fighting over street corners in New York City, which, you know, is bustling with different dealers every day, markets like Virginia and from what is it, Virginia and North Carolina or randomly throwing southern states, but those states are not, they're not as touched as much as New York. So I really feel that this also is going to show the progression of the show where she's going to go more down south and start touching markets that aren't flooded with drugs yet. So this was a very good strategy as well. Also, on top of that, um, we have to talk about obviously Lulu. Lulu. Uh, got his balls back. I think through the series we saw, like, you know, Raquel is snipping everyone's balls, period. And with this whole situation with Crown and Crown always kind of stepping to him and treating him not like an equal, treating him as less of a man. You have that whole situation with Jessica. I really feel that this was Lulu becoming the person that he tried to hide that he was previously before, but no longer was because as was shown by uh, Unique who read him to filth right when he walked through the door was basically, you don't have the heart. You, you don't wanna be a part of this anymore. Um, it's like you kind of died inside and you wanna focus on your music, but your music is also dead. It's not really going anywhere. And with this episode, he finally tapped into the, the Lulu who, whose heart was always in it. So with this, it showed the fearlessness. He, he is sick and tired of Crown, and he made that known because Crown is now, he did, he's, he's, he's crownless. Um, also, it's really interesting to see where Zazie is going to be because her response was like a screaming. It wasn't any sort of anger. It was like, oh, okay, so, so what are we going to do now? It's like, I'm bored. We're going to get rid of him. 
What's next? Is you and me? We're going to take on a team? Yay! So I'm really looking forward to how they set up everything. And I'm really looking forward to the transformations of both characters. And if I know it's only three, but I'm going to also just put in really quickly because Kingpin, Cartier, is my heart. He's my soul. And that pimp slap was the greatest thing that I have seen so far. That was amazing. So also, he fears no one and neither does his pimp slapping hand. Oh yeah, he, he almost slapped the dreadlocks off that dude, man. But um But it wasn't just that, it was <laughs> the second slap that was just it was more funny than the first one because he was genuinely scared. So when he like slapped them on the on the arm, he was like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was a good scene. But um yeah, um excellent takeaways, great observations as always. Um and yeah, like one of those takeaways I also have uh as one of mine too. Um, so, you know, I guess it's my time now. You are finished, right? Just making sure. Well, you, you um, only gave me room for three, so I went three and a half. I mean, we can, we can, we can oh, go yeah. all in later on with Haley, with Jukebox, and that whole situation with Marvin. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just, just making sure I didn't call for your third. But, yeah, um, yeah, we will be talking more about all of that stuff later on, so we'll get to it but um let me get right into my takeaways now so uh first of all um what i noticed in this episode is you know raquel she you know it seems like she's uh she's building up to something like and she's a very like interesting character to watch and observe like just you know the way she handles situations and the conversations she has um, but, you know, one thing I noticed in this episode, um, and I'm sure, you know, other others noticed it too, is that she told her brothers, we, we the viewer have been watching play out throughout the season, but like they didn't know themselves yet, you know, so Marvin, she told him that uh, Kenya is back and Jukebox has been seeing her and everything like that. Um, and then, you know, with Lulu, she, she finally told him about Crown, you know, Crown going behind his back and coming to her, making a, a proposition. Um, and, you know, my thinking is, did she do this for a reason? You know, is she doing this like to kind of earn their trust a little more? You know, even though they already kind of obey her, she's the queen, they do whatever she says, but it's like, it feels like she's building some towards something um, and, you know, it felt like her decision to tell them these things was very calculated to me. Um, so I'm wondering what that is going to lead to. Um, and, you know, we see, of course, the situation with Unique. Unique kind of got an, a one up on her. Um, you know, he he played that that card beautifully, you know, with in terms of inserting himself into the business. Um, and, you know, he's kind of overseeing the whole Italian uh, proposition now uh, where they've managed to squash the beef and now they're going to be selling uh, in a small territory in, in, in uh, Jersey. So I, I think she has a game plan of how to deal with this. And I think, you know, she, she is planning something, you know, even though uh, Unique is very cunning, but uh, Raquel is a whole, whole nother level of psychopath. So I think, uh, she she has something in the works and i think a lot of uh, her you know telling her brothers this information in this episode i think is for a reason so i can't wait to see more of that and how it plays out um next takeaway um you know this is what dana was talking about but um we like we got glimpses of future canaan in this episode um you know with him you know, obviously the, the part where he was brutally beating up the, the stick up kid, the, the dude who, uh, you know, took the money, um, you know, that's definitely Kanan right there. You know, we see lots of scenes like that in the original power uh, of Kanan just beating people up and brutalizing them and punishing them. You know, that's definitely Kanan right there. So, you know, we see that he is becoming that that person, that man. Um, and, you know, more than that also it's like, um uh what was i gonna say uh oh yeah so yeah he he also didn't need raquel in the end to resolve the issue so you know he uh, obviously he he was in charge of taking that money from one spot to another 
And of course, like when we once we as soon as we saw him walking out with famous and the bag, we knew something was gonna go left. Like we knew something was gonna happen right there and then. Like it, it wasn't hard to see that. But yeah, obviously they get robbed. Um, they go, they you know, they go looking for knives and Pat Miss Palomar gives him a gun, which was interesting. And then um, you know, they go get the money back. And as soon as they get it back, what happens? Police rolls up, Kanan runs, famous, of course, he has the bag, you know, um, and they capture Kanan, I mean, uh, famous and, and the money. And then, you know, he does go to his mother. He doesn't tell her that, you know, famous had the money when he got locked up, but he tells her famous is locked up and he, he does go to her for help, but she refuses, you know, she says, you know, that that's, he's got nothing to do with us. So he's got his mom. He can go to her, you know. She she she's very cold in how she you know responds to him, but you know she doesn't want to be mixed up with all that police business anyway. So, um, you know, he then he has to find his own way to resolve the situation, and you know he makes a calculated choice. He uses the you know the leverage he has with Howard to get you know famous out. So this is something he figured out to do by himself. He resolved the situation himself, got the money back, got famous out. Everything's good now. Like, and you know, that I assume that money got to where it's supposed to go after that. So he's he's finding ways to resolve issues on his own now without his mother's help. And that is gonna make him more dangerous. And it's also gonna make him more out of control you know, um, in terms of Raquel, because she he, he's going to kind of break away from her control a little bit if he figures out ways to resolve things himself. So that was interesting to see. Um, and then, of course, you've got the Howard element mixed in with that, too, you know, because uh, Howard, you know, is, is, is his father and Raquel doesn't like that. He's spending time with him. But this this was actually a direct result of her not willing to help him. So he had to go to Howard. So there's that whole element of it there too. So that was interesting. But but yeah, we are seeing Kanan in, in the flesh. Like he, he is becoming the Kanan we know. Um and that was interesting to see. I, I enjoyed that. But um the third takeaway, of course, you know, we got to talk about Lulu a lot today. Um he, he went and handled his business finally. You know, we know Crown has been a, a slimy individual this whole season, you know, sleeping with his woman and trying to uh, trying to cut him out the business with his own sister. Um, and, you know, he, he's been doing a lot of grimy things to, un, you know, and to undermine Lulu's control of the business and stuff like that. And, you know, finally, Lulu, you know, he handled his business. Um, and um, he might have, you know, he may have lost a business partner in that situation, but it seems like now he's gained a new companion. And um, I do have some questions about that in our discussion, question and discussion segment, but I'm wondering what the nature of this is gonna be with Zisa, you know, cause like Dana said, she she wasn't screaming. She, she didn't look very surprised. She was more just like, you know, okay, you did that. What are we gonna do now? So it's like she's she's willing to ride for him now. Um, and, you know, we saw her kind of flirt with him earlier in, in the episode, but he kind of, you know, dismissed it. So I'm wondering what the nature of their relationship will be now. And I wonder also how, you know, that is going to affect the artist manager, you know, uh, kind of roles that they have, you know. Um, and that is going to be a question that I ask a little bit later. So we'll, we'll talk more about that. But, but yeah, those are my takeaways. Um, and I'm very interested in hearing what Richard Bailey Jr. has to say now. So go ahead, Richard, when you're ready. Okay, so excellent takeaways, Gary and Dana, as always. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start by saying... This was a really good episode of Razor Canaan, and it was definitely better than last week's episode. So I would applaud the writers. I would applaud the whole team for putting it all together, because really what this episode did is that you finally started to see a lot of storylines reach a turning point uh, and a lot of things we've been waiting for since the season started. So uh, before I get into my three takeaways, let me give a shout out to Canaan. 
I am I have been his fight instructor, so I'm glad that he finally learned how to squabble in this uh episode because he he was making me look really bad in the previous episode. So I just want to say that right now. Uh I agree with a lot of what was said in the takeaway that you both had for Kanan. One other little quick detail that I do want to add though is that uh at the end of that ep this episode, he had an exchange with Howard and Howard gave him the DNA test results. And he said, yes, this is all of the answers that you need right here. So obviously, when the next episode returns, I think Kanan, now he has proof. I'm wondering if he's going to, to show that to uh, Raquel. Oh, well, you know, he has proof that he could, that, that proves that, yes, Howard is my father. So I look forward to seeing how they tell that story. But I really enjoyed what they did with Kanan in this episode and how he evolved into the Kanan that we all know um, because he just got tired of people trying to run over him. And the, the guy in the local game, the guy's name was, uh, I believe it was uh, Kenny. Uh, no, Freddie. Freddie. He was part of the gang. Uh, so, yeah, Kanan just got tired of, you know, always messing up and, and running into people who just wanted to take away from him. So he took it back. So I applaud what they did with him. And I can't wait to see what happens in the next episode. So as for my other takeaways, I want to touch on Unique very briefly. I know that the way they set this up is that in the first episode of this season, he ended up saving Marco Baselli, which it was the guy that was in prison, who ends up becoming Sal's son. So I like how they made that connection. I will say that I kind of got the impression that like Unique is really, really close with the Italians and he's known them for quite a while. I don't think we really seen that. And that, that's the one thing where obviously because he was in the jail and he took care of his son at that particular moment, I could understand they have the bond, but it kind of feels as though, you know, when Worrell told uh, Raquel about the fact that he has a connect, that they had a relationship for far longer. And we didn't really get to see that play out in the actual show. So, but with that said, I still like what they did. I still like the fact that, uh, Marco Baselli happens to live in the exact same neighborhood that uh, Tony is in, which Marvin found out. And I'm curious, and I'm very curious to see what they do with that as well. But the one thing I will say about the unique thing that I don't think we mentioned yet is that, you know, at, now that unique has this whole thing where, you know, they were able to work out a deal with Sal just so long as he is the one that's running the operation in New Jersey. Um, you saw that the, the 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 former person that Raquel had in charge was not happy when he was told, hey, you either work with Unique or you just have to leave. So my prediction is that that guy will retaliate. He may retaliate against Raquel uh, in, in the people in her organization. Definitely Unique. So I'm very curious to see what's going to happen with that because uh, it kind of feels like there's going to be some type of retaliation coming from him. But again, a master plan orchestrated by Unique. So I would give him credit and I will say that that was excellent. Um, and the final takeaway that I have for this episode, we are definitely going to talk about Jukebox. So I'll, I'll say what I got to say about that for later. But the final takeaway, I, I the, the, the story I enjoyed the most this entire episode was what they did with Lulu's character because it was a slow burn until the very end. Because if you recall, at the beginning of the episode, Lulu had an exchange with Unique. And Unique pointed out the fact that you had a chance to kill Worrell last season and you and you couldn't pull the trigger. Makes me wonder if your heart is really still in this. Okay? So that right there was how it started. And, of course, Lulu tried to play it off and said whatever. But then you see later in this episode that, um, you know, he does have an exchange with Ziza as well. And she's basically coming to him, as you said, Gary. She's flirt flirting with him, but she's also telling him that, that Cartier, is, Cartier is mad because her song is not yet on the radio, and he may take her somewhere else if the song is not on the radio soon. So in having that conversation, she reveals to him that the whole time she was singing, she was singing for him. So, yes, very flirtatious. And, of course, he said, no, we're not going to get involved in that. But then, okay, that's fine. So he's dealing with that. Now go back to what ends up happening later in this episode where Raquel confronts Lulu 
and she starts again reminding him about what Unique said. Maybe does he? Maybe he has a point. Maybe you aren't cut out for this anymore. And then she decides to also tell him, as for your boy Crown, he approached me. He wants you out of the music business. And that to me was that was it, because at that point in the episode we didn't see Crown Camacho yet at the entire episode. So at that point I was very curious because Gary made the excellent point last week where he said. This thing can't last much longer because of the tension and the fact that, you know, you saw in last week's episode, Crown got knocked out, pulled out a gun, was was talking about he was going to shoot Lulu, but Lulu stopped him. So when we finally see Crown Camacho at the end of the episode, you know, I was very excited because we have a lot of people who listen to this show, a lot of people who love the show that were very happy and waiting for this character to get uh, killed. I just want to say the way they handled that was very well done. Um, it made me think personally, it made me think because of how Lulu killed him, because he strangled him. This made me think of Power Book 2, Episode 8, Drug Related, where Drew strangled Little Guap. Because that was also a very brutal uh, killing scene. You know, it made me think about that. So I thought that was, I thought that was very well done. But then the whole thing is after that, then you see Ziza show up. And as you say, Gary, she's talking about, oh, so what are we going to do now? So Lulu is in very deep right now. And it makes me very curious to see how he's going to handle this situation because he has to, he still has to prove that crowd is wrong. He can definitely do this music stuff. He knows what he's doing, but then he also has to worry about all of this other stuff getting wrapped up in the same situation. So I can't wait to see what happens next, but Malcolm Mays did an excellent job in this episode, so we got to give him his his uh, props for that. And I look forward to seeing what happens from here. Oh yeah, agreed, agreed, and yeah, um, I like the the extra perspective you added on 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 that, you know. Um, but yeah, um, so I guess you know we're we're getting to that point in time where we can dive deeper into these topics. Uh, but before we do that quick reminder you know just real quick leave your comments you know let us know what, what you think of uh what you've said so far and everything like that hit the like button also please and you know we will do a, a live show um eventually you know if, if we see the engagement is high um and also you know check out some of the other content on the channel and hit the like button i mean uh hit the subscribe button and all that good stuff so you know another friendly reminder right there but uh, no more delays. I want to get right into the discussions because, you know, a lot of interesting stuff happened in this episode. So uh, let's get right to it. So the first question I, I had um, is, you know, there was when 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 Kanan went to get famous um, and everything like that. Um, and then, you know, we see him come out with uh, Howard and everything. But before that, we see the crackhead from, uh, you know, from the from the area, the same one who interacts with Marvin um, on a regular basis, and you know he's watching. You know, it looks like he's getting locked up, but he's watching. He's seeing everything that that's going on, and you know, crackheads they are very observant. You know, they see everything. Like, <laughs> you know, but bubbles from the wire. Like he was like he was like Neo from the Matrix or something. Like he he saw everything that happened in the streets. So um, <laughs> so obviously there's a reason why they put emphasis on this on the fact that he he was watching and seeing you know Kanan and Howard and famous so you know the question is you know what do you would you, like who is he going to tell because he's going to tell someone right so who is he going to tell about what he saw and what will the the consequences of that be you know so um that is the question so uh let's see who should I pick on first um I'll go to you first, Dana, because you're dancing right now. So go ahead. Uh, what would you think of that? I'm actually rather excited about that scene. First, I thought he was someone that I was supposed to know, but that also is to show you crackheads. Not to generalize all of crackheads, but they're always that person that you see, but you pay no attention to, but they be knowing everything. And you're like, do I know you? But you're like, I don't know you, but I feel like I know you. So I really like him in that. I feel... Who is the most equal who is searching for information? One or two people. One, we got Howard. Howard is not a crackhead, but sometimes he has crackhead-like behaviors. Not Howard. It's I meant the partner. I'm sorry. 
Um, Howard's partner, whose Shannon. name I can't Shannon. Yes. Yeah. She's very nosy. And like I said, she's she's always out there and she just won't she won't quit. She won't die. She won't go away. Um, I feel that she is the most nosiest of this group, probably even more than a crackhead. See, a crackhead is just observant. She is just nosy in other people's business and has no other, no reason for the business. And that's another thing. I don't understand Shannon's motive because one, we're not like we've been partners for all of all eternity, right? Where like, I feel like you're hiding something from me, but we always share everything. To me, this feels brand new, but she wants to know all of his information and all of his business. And I don't see her sharing her business. And so she's just really annoying. But there's a point I'm making. I feel that she and her nosiness is going to have her in the streets looking for answers and looking for clues. And the people who have the most knowledge is the crackhead man. And I feel because he's always there, who is to say that he didn't see when Kanan shot Howard? Who is to see to say that he wasn't there when everything else went down on that block that was illegal, the buildings and what's going on really within them. So I feel that he could be a key to the information that she needs. Why does she need this information? I swear I do not know and she irks my soul. Another thing I feel is we have Raquel as well. We know that Raquel, um, she needs her eyes on the streets or streets on the eyes. And you know, just like when we had with Bubbles, he fed certain information to the cops that he liked and to some of the people on the block that he liked and also feared. So I feel that that could also come into play. Raquel has that stronghold on that community, especially when we know what's going on with that whole building situation. Um, so I do feel that she could be someone that could go to him as well. She needs resources in order to get this mob down, even though I don't, that's the issue is, I don't know if her main concern is with the New Jersey mob because once Cartier gave her that information about going to the South and cleaning the money and buying the paintings and turnover with that, maybe she may divert her focus and go into the South. But I feel 100% that Shannon's nosy behind is definitely probably going to approach him. And maybe he will have something to do with Raquel as well going forward. Or Unique, because Unique is back on the streets and I don't see him wanting to take over the South right now. So Unique wants to, you know, come back as well. But I'm going to definitely say uh, Crackhead Shannon. Yeah, no, yeah, you make a good point because, um, you know, once the, the, the dope fiend is processed and everything, um, they, you know, uh, maybe uh, Shannon will will see him around and and think you know have you ever seen anything you know going on in the neighborhood or you know with this with this officer Howard who's who's usually in the neighborhood and then you know he might get to talking or something so yeah that's that's a good point. But, and if um, you look at the how it was because it could have been in any scene where they focused in on him but they didn't. It was one hundred percent during him getting arrested when you saw Howard speaking to Kanan and getting the book bag. So, and he focused in on them, not famous dumb behind, but Kanan and Howard. Yeah, yeah. And and Shannon is being very and nosy, of course. Cool. Like Kim Kardashian in the bushes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, and Shannon, you know, she is being uh, very nosy in this episode because she she found out about howard uh he used to be undercover and all that stuff you know she got some paperwork on him so yeah it makes sense you're muted she, she seemed mad about that oh he was undercover and he didn't tell me who are <laughs> you who are that's all i want to know is who is you to tell a grown man who's probably who has been doing this longer than you older than you does not really care about your existence why are you so up in his butthole with this whole situation? He was an undercover cop and he didn't even tell me. That's the whole point of being an undercover cop. I don't get it. Make it make sense. Make her existence make sense to me. Yeah, I, I'm guessing she's obligated to uh, investigate the shooting. And, you know, I guess she's finding out more and more and it's just sending her down a rabbit hole. But, um, but yeah, you know, she is no too like she. 
Howard didn't have to tell her, like he, he wasn't obligated to tell her anything, you know, um, they were just partners. So um, he's not obligated to tell you nothing unless you're working on the exact same case. What, who am I to you and why do I have to tell you your business? If you used to ask me right now, what did you have for breakfast? Why do you want to know? <laughs> I'm not obligated to tell you. So I just don't understand what her position is and why is there a, mo here's the thing. Just give me a motive, even if it's something stupid. Because right now she doesn't even have a motive as to why she keeps questioning this man. Aside from, I'm supposed to know. Why? He just met you yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, let's let's hear from uh, Mr. Richard Bailey now. What would what, you uh, think about this whole, uh, the dope fiend, you know, who's he gonna talk to? And also you can chime in on the Shannon thing too. So go ahead. I well, okay, I think that was a great question. I think Dana made a very good point because you did see him getting arrested. So in my mind, it makes sense for Shannon to be the one that comes into contact with him. She was there at the same time that she saw Kanan and Howard, you know, have their little exchange. So she's definitely going to be fishing for some more answers in the next episode. Uh, I'm a little surprised that she has not approached Jukebox about this yet. So that's probably coming because jukebox i mean she knows that jukebox knows kanan they have some type of connection and i think that at some point she is going to try to get to her to try to get some information about this too uh but the one thing i, I did want to answer when you asked about shannon why is she so nosy i also don't really understand that but the only thing i could think of is that we know that all the stuff that happened with nicole last season how it made her look bad and we saw at the beginning of this season, she got chewed out by her superiors about that she wasn't really focused and all this other stuff. So my guess is that she feels that is also somehow connected to what's happening with Howard. The fact that he hasn't been telling her any information about what's really been going on with him and Kanan. Uh, and that's why she thinks because it's all connected, she definitely, definitely feels as though she needs to uncover the truth for whatever reason. Now, I agree 100%. It would be best if she had a motive because it would make a lot more sense. But uh, I guess uh, we'll have to see how the story uh, uh, unravels. But what I was going to say, uh, because, again, I think Dana made a very good point that Shannon is probably going to be who um, this crackhead eventually talks to. But I was also thinking if the crackhead, when the, when the crackhead eventually gets out of jail, because we already know that's 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 probably going to happen. He's definitely going to tell Marvin about this because in this episode, you know, Raquel made it a point. First and foremost, she finally had a heart to heart with Marvin and she told him, I didn't like the fact that you put your hands on jukebox, which I think that conversation was long overdue for that to be, to happen. But then she tells him about Kenya. And the thing is that this whole time Raquel has been having this, all this stuff going on with Howard. And I kind of feel like, for Marvin to find out that information and then confront her about that, she probably won't like that because she feels that she always has control over every situation. So I kind of feel because of the relationship that that crackhead has with Marvin, he's probably going to definitely tell Marvin when he gets the opportunity to actually get out. But I think it makes sense because he was arrested for now that Shannon is somebody who he could definitely, who definitely will probably talk to in the next episode. We have to see how that pans out. But, uh, I look forward to seeing what happens for sure. That's that's what I will say because it's a lot of drama, and it can go in any direction really. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah. That that's another thing I was uh thinking. You know, maybe he, he'll tell Marvin because you know they they made it a point to show us in the last episode that those two characters interacted and stuff, and um you know he gave, he gave him the the uh, the drugs even though you know he was busy moving the body or whatever. So yeah. Um, I could definitely see maybe those two characters coming in contact again and then him telling, you know, Marvin about what he saw. But um, it's, it's it's definitely interesting if, he's, if if the Shannon thing happens, though. Like, that would be super interesting. But go ahead, Rich, you were going to say something. Oh, no, I agree. And, and since we were talking about Marvin and we spoke about Lulu earlier, there is something I did want to say earlier. I, I'm going to say it now. I know that a lot of people watch this episode and they'll see that, Raquel made it a point to tell Lulu this information. And she made a point to also tell Marvin the information about Jukebox. 
the reason why she did that, in my personal opinion, is because of how this episode started and the conversation she had where she's talking about, I want to go national, I want to expand. This was the very first time that Marvin said that he agreed with Lulu. You probably shouldn't do that right now, you know, because she said she wasn't going to she wasn't going to stand down. This is until all the stuff happened with Unique. So I kind of you saw that she was very defiant and she wasn't happy that he said that. She's like, oh, you know, this this that's when she said, yeah, Caden is getting involved again. And maybe he'll be the only one that steps up, even though Marvin has still been loyal up until this point. But that was an important thing right there, because after she got heard that information, it's like she felt when she had opportunity to talk to them further, she said, oh, well, she didn't hold back on what she really wanted to say. So that could be the motivation as to why she told them this. Um, and, uh, and, and again, we'll have to see how she reacts to the situation. As far as Crowd Camacho, I'm very curious to see how she's going to react to that when she finds out eventually. But um. Yeah, she is the one, the master manipulator, the one that is running the show. So I'm glad that they made her be the one to reveal this information to Marvin and Lulu. And then you saw they reacted in their own different ways in this episode because of what they heard. So that was very, very well done. Yeah, excellent uh, observation there. Yeah, like we, we, yeah, we, we usually we see uh, Marvin agree with Raquel like he he's very uh he's very much on her side in a lot of cases but yeah he actually agreed with Lulu and and yeah that is a, an important point because now you know Raquel now that she told them these things she she's probably gonna want some kind of you know some kind of leverage or pull from them so yeah um go ahead Dana just to quickly say I viewed that differently I originally thought that she was gonna use that as a power move like hope um, you can't even run your house properly. Look at how you treat your kid and your kid is running away from you and or, and trying to find her real mother. Also, if you hit her again, I'm going to kill you. That's kind of how I viewed it. I didn't view it as like a kind of a power play in, in that, like, I need something from you. I'm, I thought it was something like, um, I'm going to tell you this. And if it hurts you, it hurts you. Ha ha. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. um, two, two things can be true. I think she meant that also when she said it. I think I definitely think she meant that, you know, but um, she and then, you know, she instantly went into telling him uh, the information. So I think, you know, both things could be true that, you know, she she really will whoop, whoop his ass, you know, if he uh, if he messes, <laughs> I mean, if he messes with you, but it's clear. Yeah. Yeah. So killing. Yeah, it was very clear about killing somebody. So that that's a foreshadowing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, that's not what happens to, to Marvin, though. But we'll see. Yeah, uh, but yeah, go ahead, Rich. I think you were gonna say something also. Oh no, no. I, 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 yeah. I mean, I think I said all I had to say on on this particular question. But uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens from here for sure. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So let's get to uh, some more questions now. So, um going back to you know what i was saying about lulu uh, i think we all kind of brought it up also but you know now that you know with, with how zisa acted in this episode you know with flirting with lulu and then at the end she sees what he does to crown um and then you know she's like her reaction is you know what are we gonna do now you know which seems like she's gonna be very cooperative with him um you know so how do you think this is going to affect the dynamic of you know the music uh business that they were getting into you know the artist manager dynamic like how how is this going to affect things if they kind of get into a criminal relationship and you know maybe even they'll get into a, a real relationship you know so but how will this affect the the, the whole you know music business thing that uh lulu was getting into and then you also have cartier um who is involved in in Zisa, you know um and he's waiting for this you know music to to, to come out and hit, hit the airwaves and everything so you know how how do you see this you know impacting things with, with those characters so um i'll go to you first this time rich uh, what do you think about that well it's about to get very messy uh we know that uh you know dana had an opportunity to interview malcolm mays uh, earlier this season, and he alluded to that uh, Malcolm Mays was going to, to have some issues with another character on the show outside of Crown. I think that Cartier is that character. And it's a very complex situation because you see Cartier is getting closer to Raquel. 
um, at the same time. So, you know, we what we do know from the previous episode is that when Lulu accompanied Crown to talk to the guy to try to try to get this 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 song on the radio, this guy did not take Lulu serious at all. He was willing to take Crown serious, but again, that the the song is still not playing on the radio. So, I don't know what I don't know if Lulu's going to have any success. Maybe if he uses force when he goes to meet up with this guy again to try to get the radio on the air to try to get the song on the radio. But um, I think it's, I think at this point, he's not going to have any success with that. And that is going to lead to some issues where, you know, Cartier is going to basically take her away from the label, but then he'll probably find out, Oh, you, you you like this Lulu guy. It's, it's some type of relationship that you're trying to have with him. It's going to complicate things further. So I say it's going to get very messy. Um, and the other thing, and I, and I want to give a very special shout out to uh, Jacob Latumba, who always comments on the show, because he made a very good comment last week. It's something that we did not touch upon, which is that, speaking of Lulu, last season when D, when D Wiz got killed, the last time you saw, the last time that Jukebox saw D Wiz is when he was in the car with Lulu, and then he winds up dead. She didn't tell anybody that information, but so far this season, you see their relationship has started to have issues because of that whole song thing. So you already know now she doesn't like Ziza. If she sees Lulu is messing around with Ziza, that's a problem. If she hears about what happened to Crown, that's a problem. And she can definitely relay that information that he has something to do with D-Wiz. Maybe she would tell Kanan or somebody. So that right there is something that is very important. And I'm very curious to see how they get to that point. But I do want to say uh, that was an excellent observation. So I have to give him credit for that because I wasn't thinking about that as we were watching the episode. Um, so I look forward to seeing what happens. But uh, I'm just saying right now, I personally like Lulu and Ziza as the uh, power couple, so to speak, uh, doing, uh, you know, dangerous things together. Uh, she's definitely better than Jessica. She's not as annoying as Jessica yet, but uh, we'll see. But um, let's see what happens. That's all I have to say. But it's going to get messy because Cartier, I don't think he's going to like Lulu messing around with her. It's supposed to be just business. Again, Lulu ha didn't really uh, respond to the flirtatious stuff in this episode, but that may, that's going to possibly change over time. We have to see how, how, how it evolves. But she's definitely into him. So he definitely need to watch out in, in those regards. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Excellent points. And yeah, shouts to, uh, you know, what was it? Jeremiah Lutumba uh, who, who said that. Yeah, that it, yes. Jeremiah. Yeah. Jeremiah uh, Lutumba. My apologies. Jeremiah Lutumba. Yes. Thank you for correcting me. Yeah, no, no problem. But yeah, that, that was a great point because uh, I do remember that happening in the last season. But like you, I, I wasn't thinking about it as we were watching this season. So. So, yeah, a uh, great point there. I do think that might come back. Uh, you know, into the story in some way. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious to see how uh, this Lulu and Zisa thing will play out. Uh, so Dana, let me know if you got any additional thoughts on that. Ken, um, I think, as Richard said previously, Malcolm Mays answers this question, um, where basically he, I can pull up the clip right now if you want to hear, but basically he says that Cartier is someone that is not going away and him being a part of this music business and them basically fighting over Ziza. We've seen previously that the whole situation with Crown, how he handled Crown after so many times of being bullied. And because of that, he's gotten his old streak back or maybe a new streak back where he has to implement the things that he has learned when, during his time with Raquel and running the streets with her. He has to start implementing that with his music business. And in order for him to do that, he can't be sitting around going, OK, yeah, all right. And being, you know, really quiet and having people step over him. He's now transformed into a new person or into the old person that he was. And with that, we're going to get a lot of altercations with him and Cartier. For remember, Cartier, this is all money for him. This is another source of income. This is how he cleans his money and he owns these different businesses for money. For 
Lulu, yeah, Lulu, he, this is his passion. This is, the, you know, it's not a hobby as Raquel likes to constantly call it. It's not a hobby for him at all. This is something that he is passionate about and is also a reason why he gravitates to jukebox a lot. Um, so also wanted to bring up jukebox as well within the interview. He explained that, you know, he has Ziza and that's one of the artists and we've already seen the conflict between Ziza and jukebox. And with Crown gone now, he can step up and put in the artist that he wants without people telling him what's right or wrong until Cartier comes in. But at the moment, he can better manage Jukebox. And we're going to see whether or not that comes into conflict with Ziza. At the moment, it seems like Ziza doesn't want any of Jukebox's smoke. So in terms of songs and stealing songs and going back and forth, I don't think that that's going to happen anymore. You know, she came and she approached Lulu about that whole song situation. And he really didn't respond. But you could see the way how she approached him was like, I don't want to do that again. Let's not have that happen. Um, and he talked about how they, they sang the song differently. Um, but I don't think that this that jukebox is going to just be someone's songwriter. Again, I do feel something is going to happen major because when we saw her as an adult, she's not singing. She may, I don't think she, does she hum? I'm not even sure she hums. She may hum. She hummed one time when she was holding um, Tariq hostage. She, she hummed and said that she used to listen to the jukebox. Um, but that part of her is dead. And I really want to know whether or not Mar not Marvin, Lulu had some kind of hand in doing that. Does she get crossed again where she's like, I'm done with this? And then also we have the joker of the whole card, the situation that we cannot predict, and that is being Cartier. So I look forward to this new step that he's going to take, uh, take and I really like the fact that Crown is dead, and then I want to see more of Mean Lulu, because we kind of got that in, a pre in the previous episode when he was standing at the, you know, the, the record sign and he was looking over kind of what Raquel did when she looked over her city. That record label is the equivalent of his city. So he's he's ready to snatch up and take the artist and probably be more a lot more aggressive. And the whole romantic situation, I'm the only person who's like, just don't get involved. Because once you mix business and pleasure, it gets tacky. And you know, we had that whole situation with Jessica and it's just raggedy and everybody it seems to be raggedy. I want them to be that Bonnie and Clyde team. I want them to be partners where like, you know what, if Cartier starts doing something, maybe she starts, maybe she does something behind Cartier's back. Maybe they set up a, mur maybe Cartier gets murdered because of both of them. I don't know, I'm only speculating, but I want them to be that tag team. And I want Jukebox to come in as well and maybe the three amigos. And they're, they're tackling this because you need your artist and you need that producer and you need someone with a sound in order for something to happen. If you look just for random example, Beyonce, she has 500 people behind her in terms of when it comes to producing and making sure she gets her songs and her music out. She needs to be more, he needs to be more um, aggressive with that. And it just can't be him. He needs a team. Yeah, at some point. Uh, that, that's what I was going to say, too. I, I could definitely see him trying to, you know, recruit more people or get some help. And one person I was thinking of, you know, maybe he'll even go to Famous and be like, yo, come and intern at, at the business and everything. You know, maybe I'll let you get on a song, you know, but come on, come and work with me and help out at the studio for a little bit, you know. Um, he could do something like that because, you know, Famous, he, he's fiending to get back in the studio, so... Yeah. What was you going to say? No, I wanted that to be like the running gag of the whole show. Every episode of every season. You might get back in the booth. Keep writing. And he never does. But he keeps writing. Yeah. And it also, yeah, it kind of yeah, he got his feelings hurt in jail when it was like, oh, I threw that in the garbage. Yeah. Okay, he's turning into <laughs> spooky. I want him to get that crackhead. I know he's going to be. Yeah, I, I definitely, like, the more I see Famous, I definitely feel like something's going to happen to him. Like, you know, poor guy. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah that. I just I was gonna say that that was great misdirection in this episode because yeah something could have happened to him. You saw him get snatched up, snatched up by the police. Like oh wait a second, and then I, when I saw that guy approaching him in the jail cell, I thought hey wait is he about to get shanked here in the jail? And then no, hey your song is trash. So that's yeah he did get killed, but just metaphorically, not physically. You know what what threw me is remember when he got arrested and then the white cop came out with the baton and he pulled out the baton. Oh, I yeah. was like, mm -hmm. oh, he going to die today. Because you kept saying, someone dies, someone dies. And I'm like, yay, it's famous. Well, Crown, because Crown was an afterthought. That's, gonna, that's probably still going to happen at some point. I just, I want to see how they're going to tell that story. Pookie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, um, interesting play. I can't wait to, to see what they say in the comments. But uh, let's get to another uh, question here. So, um, you know, we 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 got we finally got to see um, you know Marvin interact with Kenya, you know, Jukebox's mother in this episode, um, and it, it didn't go like I thought it was going to go. And I want the the question I want to ask is: Do you think that you know Marvin was able to kind of handle this interaction? because of his anger management that he's getting from Renee, you know, like, did he handle this in a better way? Because it's like, he, he walked away. There wasn't a huge confrontation. Obviously he said, you know, she should leave or whatever. Um, but yeah, like he, he didn't get as angry as I thought he would. So, you know, is, is the anger management really getting through to him and did it help him in this scene? So, uh, what would you think about that, uh, Dana? Okay, so how I'm viewing this, Marvin and Lulu are gonna switch places in terms of how we how they handle certain things. We've seen the aggressive side of Lulu come out, and now we're seeing like the soft, funny side. To me, Marvin was hilarious this episode, and he's funny without even trying to be funny. He's just that natural comedic way where we saw him interacting with the New Jersey mobster guy and the part when he was in the anger management class and he corrected his own language, and he felt so proud. I was so proud of him, and he was like, hey, I did it. I adjusted my language. I was so happy for him. Um, I do feel that I forgot the question. Yeah, so did, did the anger management help him when he went to see Kenya, Jukebox's mother? Oh, oh absolutely. I don't see, well, it's, I was going to say, I don't see him beating up on women, but then we saw what happened with Jukebox. Um, I will say that I thought he would be very more, it would be more aggressive in tone and approach and maybe an argument or something being thrown. And we really didn't get that. He was very firm in what he said. He believed in exactly what he said. And Kenya was shooken up. Whether or not she's going to jump up and disappear, I don't think so. I, I don't feel that. But he let it known that she is not welcome in his presence. And you cannot just decide you want to be mom at, what is you, box 16, 17 by now? Um, so all of these years, be, yes, I see what you're doing something. Okay. So all, oh, yes, go ahead. Go ahead. all these yeah. years, you know, you left your child in order to do a music career. From what I understand, it wasn't like we had an agreement or in a pack and be like, you know, I'm going to give you one year, then I'm going to come down there. We're going to support each other. We're going to be a family. She took off and she just randomly now lives in Harlem. I feel to be closer to her child. And while she she hoped that um, Jukebox would come visit her or probably come into her life, which is why she moved so closely to her, um, she didn't fully go out and initiate things, but she kind of set it up in the whole, what would you call it? Um, maybe she speaking out to the universe. I don't know how you would describe it, but she definitely put the wheels in motion for there to be some type of interaction. Um, with Marvin, he handled this the best way that he can. I still want my dinner scene. I got a dinner scene, but that was not the scene that I wanted. Um, I still want my dinner scene where we fully hash the situation out. And the way that Marvin is trying to approach Jukebox, I really wonder if it's too late. I wonder if, if, that relationship can ever be 
put back together. It won't be the same as it was previously, but can I at least get a hi? Hope you're doing well. Bye. We didn't really get that in terms of interaction and we still haven't gotten that. It's just been like me mugging and stares. And I understand, I understand both of their points of view. Marvin is very wrong on what he did, but you're slowly starting to understand because that anger is no longer there as it was. He's able to express himself more. And so his, his interactions and his explanations and reasoning for why he may have handled the situation as wrong as it is, is starting to become more clearer. So from a viewer standpoint, I like this new dimension. It's adding, you know, a more dimension, three dimensional character instead of him just being the angry brother. Um, so overall, I do feel that this is not enough to scare Kenya, but he was able to let his feelings be known. And I wonder, how seriously Kenya is going to take his, not threats, but this conversation. Will he have to go back to the old Marvin in order to get Kenya to go away? Yeah, um, one thing I'll say is I don't trust Kenya for some reason. Like she, like her demeanor is like, it's too like, cool and calm like i feel like there, there's something up with her like there's something that we, we just haven't seen I, I don't trust her so i i feel like there's gonna be some sort of situation where you know jukebox kind of is caught off guard by her and that might be what leads to her going back to you know uh her father to you know um get his his advice or whatever but yeah, I, I just don't trust her. But Rich, you know, he's giving me these funny faces again. So no, I go, go, no, no, hold on. Go, go, go to Dana first, and then I. No, I'll I just want to throw in there really quickly. Where'd the money come? Because they're on Fifth Avenue. They're not at like you know uh, Conway's or Walmart. Where's this money coming from? What she do? I have questions. You a failed singer. You you in the church? I thought you was like a secretary in the church. Are you stealing the money? That was a lot of bags. That was a lot of bags, and not just a lot of bags. She had white people waiting on her in the eighties, and she tried on dresses. Where is the money coming from? <laughs> yeah, she she she's doing nineties nineties. Yeah, it's the nineties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the nineties. Sorry about the eighties. I'm throwing out numbers, but the point is, she had white people waiting on her. That's money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, go go ahead, Rich. Well, I think it's very interesting that you think something is up with Kenya. Uh, I, I I'm very curious to see where they're going with that. Let me first respond to what you said about Marvin. Uh, this this is a test. This stuff with Kenya will continue. This is that what you saw was the beginning, where he told her you should stay gone and that's it. Obviously, she is still going to stay firm because now she has a relation. She is starting to build a relationship with Jukebox now, so she's not going to listen to anything that he said. Um, so I'm curious to see what happens with that. But I know y'all made the comment that Marvin wasn't really angry, but I don't. I you know I don't completely agree with that because when Raquel told him, you could physically see that he was angry when he when he heard that news. He maybe took some time to process it. And then that was when he decided that he would go ahead and approach her. But this is not over with. That was the start of uh, of their interactions between each other. And yeah, I think that you'll see more about that. One other thing I do want to mention, though, in regards to the comment that maybe something is up with Kenya. We don't know exactly what's up with Kenya yet. But what I can tell you, something that stood out to me in this episode, which I think you both are going to touch on at some point as well is the fact that when she brought jukebox to the store and had her trying on all those dresses, she was saying, yeah, now you're starting to look like my daughter. So she also was taking, paying attention to her image. And this is what I was saying, you know, cause Dana made a very good point last week when she said jukebox was dressing up, but she was doing it for her mom. And that was hundred percent correct. But you see, I think the mother now is talking about, you know, when Jukebox tried on that that, that, that second dress, she's like, is, is that it? No, this is it for this store. 
like she's taking, she's talking about she's going to take her to other stores to get more dresses. So she's trying to change her into this person. And this is again, the manipulation stuff. Cause you know, parent, a parent will try to, I guess they want the kid to look better, try to try to control the image to some degree. And, and so that it looks like this, so she look, looks like this is my daughter. I mean, I don't know what the angle is that she's going here with, but I, I that stood out to me because we've talked about the image thing this entire uh, season so far with jukebox. So I'm curious to see how she, I, I kind of feel like, because you saw how she responded to her mom at some point, she is going to tell her, no mom, that's not, that's not me, you know? And then the whole interaction with her friends that she used to rob with, they used to do all that stealing. They ran into her as well. So I think her mom is eventually going to learn about, what jukebox has been up to her past and all this other stuff. It's only a matter of time, but I feel like she's going to definitely say something to her mom in the next episode or thereafter, because she's going to start to say, Hey, if you're going to try to change me, do not try to change me. This is who I am. So I want to see how they're going to tell that story. Go ahead. Go ahead. I don't feel that the change is intentional as in like i'm trying to change you i feel like she genuinely i don't know she she left when she was a baby so we can argue and say that she genuinely does not know that she is a tomboy gay and i feel that what she's doing is what any other parent who may feel guilty for not being there does and that's spoiling their child with things and by not her knowing what her actual style and her taste is, because she never had that conversation with her. If you really looked at the conversations, I think they've been surface conversations. And it can easily be because I don't fully know you yet and we're going to get there. But she is responding on a surface level in terms of, here, let me buy you things. Do you want lunch? Do you want some food? You know, you bribe me with food, we best friends automatically. But the point is, she is just trying to be like, I, uh, that guilty, I feel guilty for this, so let me give you things and let me show up, you know, all of a sudden at this moment. But I wonder how will that response be when Jukebox or maybe somebody else tells her, you know, she's gay. That's again, I want that dinner table scene. Um, I want to know how she'll respond to that. I want to know if she, because she kept saying, you're my daughter, you're my daughter, you're my daughter. And yes, she is her daughter, but I'm wondering, does she mean it as like, oh, you're the little girl, as in like the actual sexual identity of a little girl. And I don't know if she does, because she doesn't know that she's gay. So I don't know how that plays out. And I want to say the wrong thing and offend someone, because I don't know the correct terminology myself. But I just wanted to know how that will play out later on. But right now, Kenya is just being the guilty mom. And even when the friends came, she didn't judge her, or if she did, she didn't say anything vocally about it. She did not say anything. Why are you hanging out with those little ragamuffins? She didn't say anything at all. She just let it be. But maybe that is certain clues or certain things that she's picking up. Or maybe she's just oblivious to it because she's one, she wants her daughter back, or two, there's a much larger scheme at play. What it is, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, excellent points. Um, I really don't know where they're going to go with this. Um, you know, I will say, yeah, I do agree that part of her, you know, part of Kenya definitely wants to catch up on that lost time. Um, but also, it, I think it's also a little bit of, like, sometimes, you know, um, parents can get into this like you know overly enthusiastic mode of trying to like make the the child like them as well like they want them to kind of have the same traits and same you know characteristics that they do without seeing that you know the child is an individual also and they have like their own you know way of uh of existing so um i think it's a little bit of both those things so but yeah uh like i said go ahead Dana. Are you gonna say no, something? No, kind of just to piggyback off of that, all of her responses yeah. every time Jukebox does something was, that's my voice. That's my this. That's my mm -hmm. style of dressing. So that it does go into play with what you're saying, trying to make her into that image. And she was a failed singer who couldn't make it in Las Vegas. Now she yeah. hears a voice, that's my voice. 
Yeah. So I don't so, know if she's going to push something into jukebox. Oh, you got to be like me, better, you know, take the singing thing to the high heavens. And if you notice, jukebox sings because it's cathartic for her. She has a talent, but she just wants to get everything out and those emotions out. She doesn't seem to be like someone who's like, I'm going to go to Hollywood and I'm going to be a star and I'm the next, I don't know, 90s of Beyonce, Mary J. Vosh. So, yeah, I don't see that. Yeah. It's like um, Kenya kind of wants to live through Jukebox now, you know, I guess because her career failed. Now she she wants to live again through her, I guess. But that's that's not necessarily what Jukebox wants. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's interesting. And of course, we also got the scene where uh, she some of her old friends bumped into her on the street when she was with her mom. Um, so I'm sure that happened for a reason, too. Like she's going to be reminded of, you know, who she really is. Um, and of course, you know, we like you said, Dana, we see how Jukebox ends up, you know, uh, barely even singing. So, yeah, I'm sure there's going to be some some things happening there. She did hum. She hummed. <laughs> she hummed. She hums to Tariq. Um, but yeah, so interesting points there. Uh, I do have one more question that I really want to get to. So let's get to that. So. Um, uh so we we see the the whole unique thing take a turn in this episode like you know he's kind of finessed the game and got himself back you know um into the business and he has to work alongside raquel on this jersey expansion um and you know this was like he he laid the pieces of this over the last two episodes or so you know we saw him talking with Warrell, and then um you know he uh uh, what, what happened last week? Something happened last week as well. Um, but yeah, we saw him putting the pieces together for this, you know, and, and it all played out in this episode. Um, uh, but I want to ask you guys, you know, we see that Unique clearly has a game plan here of, of, you know, how he's going to deal with this whole thing. Because of course, you know, he got locked up in the last season um, because of Howard getting shot. So he got framed and he knows who framed him. So he has some sort of agenda or game plan, you know, to get back at Raquel. But, you know, um, do you think Raquel has a game plan too now after seeing this episode? Like, does she have a way or a plan that she is going to try and exercise to finesse Unique out of the game? Um, so there, there, there might be a few ways she can achieve this. Um, you know, we saw there was some beef with the guy that Unique is replacing, you know, he wasn't too happy like rich said earlier um so there's some things that can happen here but um yeah just just want to ask do you think both of these characters are plotting against each other in a way i guess and how do you think that could play out so i'll go to you first uh richard with that one what do you think uh that's a good question uh i think uh Unique's plan now is to, I mean, he got, he, he's in a, he's in a position of power. What I do believe is going to happen, you know, I don't know as far as Raquel is concerned, how he's going to deal with her. I think Raquel is in an interesting situation. She has to work with him. And then as Dana mentioned earlier, she's been talking to Cartier and thinking about how she can get on his level. So I don't know if maybe she would try and get him involved in any of this stuff. I mean, we have to wait and see. One thing I will say, though, and I do believe this is going to happen, either if it's not, if it doesn't happen in the next episode before this season, I do see Unique getting some form of payback on Dean. Because you recall earlier in this season, when he got out, he went to Dean. Dean's like, no, streets are too hot for you. Now, this guy has the entire backing of the Italian mob. So he's going to definitely do something to Dean. Either, I don't know if they're going to come after him or some people in his organization, whatever, but he's going to find a way to, to, to show him, hey, listen, I'm in a position of power now. You didn't help me when I wanted and needed help. So now I'm going to do something to make you feel make you make you feel the pain. So I look forward to seeing what that is. But in terms of Raquel, I think Raquel has a lot of things going on right now. Uh, so I'm very curious to see if she has a plan. But I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Because, again, the Italians were very clear. If Unique is not running this this operation, then it's not happening. So they're going to have to really think about how they're going to try to uh, get, get strategic with trying, with trying to take him down. So we'll see. Yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. Because uh, yeah, Unique has the back the backing of the Italians, so she can't just remove him from the chessboard because they're they're going to be angry about it. So yeah, whatever she does, it has to be you know expertly planned and, and implemented. But um, Dana, have you got any thoughts on uh, what you think might happen with uh, Raquel and Unique? Rest in peace to Dean's grandma, because she's going to go. She's going to get God. <laughs> Rest in peace to her. Um, oh. um, I see this as the uh, Stringer Bell, uh, Marla, what is it? Marla, no, who was his name? <gasps> Avon, Avon huh? Boxer. No, it was Stringer and the other one who were like enemies until the dude got shot in the head by a five-year-old. Um, so I, I see this as something I hope is played out for the long period and that they're always just rivals. Um, but I here's the thing. Raquel, I do believe, is going to eventually get back at Unique. But right now, she, as we already discussed, she can't make that move. So I do see her doing what Cartier kind of, you know, not even suggested, but was just explaining. And that's going into markets that are untouched. Um, and also at the same time, not wanting to get shot up by the Italians. So it's a win-win. Go down to, I don't know, where were we previously? Wasn't it Virginia where they sent Canaan um, in? Yeah. Virginia. Yeah. That's down south. I think maybe they probably gave us Virginia as a way to set things up. She already has family down there. She can all, she has roots there, she has family there, so she can easily put ties down there in order to have a business and have that grow into something that is more profitable than New York City where you're fighting with everything because again, the product is not always available. So he can, she can start, she can charge like, you know, that high extra money for something because it's, again, the markets are not flooded. So I feel that they showed us Virginia for an actual reason. Uh, I would love for this show to be a tri-state, no, dual state situation. Sorry, can't count. Um, so this, I feel, could be something that grows their business. She already has family. Maybe we'll get to learn more about the family and how that runs thing. And, and also Kanan. He can learn again more about the business and setting up in different spots. So I think that this could be a win-win. And then maybe not right now, maybe in season three, We'll revisit this right now because unique right now he can't be touched. He has the whole New Jersey mobster situation protecting him, and that could cause a war if she just starts randomly killing him. So this works out, gives everyone a breather, and it doesn't keep the story stale. You know, oh, we had this already last season with him and unique going back and forth. This keeps the story fresh, but also we have to revisit this much later. So still remember what's going on. Yeah, yeah, good points. Um, the like expanding out of state uh, could be a way to to uh, deal with this issue uh, because you know if, if she's getting money out of state, she could just be like, okay, you need this is yours. Like I'm 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 out of this, but you you can buy the drugs from me, but you run this how you see fit, and then she's getting money out of state. But I don't know if her plan is to actually sell drugs out of state or just wash money. Or something, but um, but I guess we'll we'll see uh, what the intention is there. But yeah, um, that is one way she could deal with this. Um, but yeah, I I just feel like from my perspective, like these are two very calculating um, individuals. You know, Unique and Raquel. Like, and you know, Unique has experience running his own operation. Um, so, you know, he is not going to want to conform to Raquel's orders. Like, you know, he's going to want to do things his way, um, you know, if he has some level of power. So I think they're going to bump heads a lot and that is going to lead to some tension. But another thing I'm thinking is, you know, because in the original power, we see that um, there were a lot of times when Ghost and Tommy were actually at odds and wanted to kill each other. But then a new bigger threat or, you know, a new boss appears or whatever, uh, a new final boss, you know, um, and they have to deal with that situation. You know, they have to deal with the new um, overarching antagonist. 
So I'm, I'm also wondering if maybe something happens like that, where, you know, maybe Sal, Sal becomes a problem, the Italians or something, or, you know, a new threat comes along that they have to kind of coexist and deal with together. Um, you know, that could be something. And, you know, of course, they won't be friends. They won't be friends forever. But, you know, maybe for a time, they will have to just coexist for survival. Um, but, yeah. What, uh, any thoughts on that? Go ahead, Rich. Uh, I'm going to make a prediction. I believe that Sal's son is going to get killed. And maybe it's a situation where... You know, Marvin's going after Tony. You know, I don't know if he's somewhere in the same, because, I mean, they made a mention of the fact that he is in the same neighborhood, uh, the exact same neighborhood that she's in. I kind of made me think if that was the person that she was supposed to get married to, but we saw that's not the same person, because I went back and I saw that episode last week. It's a totally different person that she's getting married to. Maybe she could have been messing around with this other guy, though. We don't we don't know that. But what I will say is that... um. I think Sal's son is going to get killed and that's going to make it very complicated because once that happens, you know, if, if, if it is suspected that Raquel or Marvin had anything to do with that, that makes the whole relationship an issue. And again, unique is working with the Italians that kind of complicates and puts him in the middle of what could potentially happen between those two sides. So I think once that conflict happens, that's where things are going to really start to get out of hand. So we have to wait and see, but I, I don't think that that character is going to survive for much longer. I can't tell you how it's going to happen because I don't know how they're going to do it, but I'm just telling you the fact that Marvin is now sniffing around him trying to get information that is, that was in there for a reason. So I'm curious to see what that's all about. Mm, yeah. Excellent point. Yeah. Cause we do know if, if anything happens to, to Saul's, you know, son, yeah, it's gonna get bad for for everybody. So, yeah, that, that's 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 an excellent point. Go ahead, Dana. One, please do not give me any more super fans. I am super tired of super fans. <laughs> what you describe with them? We hate each other, but we're gonna tag team. Don't do that, and it's gonna happen. You see, you said it, so it's not already now into fruitation. So I'm very mad at you, Gary. Uh, I don't be mad at me. This is this is something they use in the power playbook all the time. We've seen it in book two as well. You know, ghosts. Look. You know, with with tomatoes. Kane and Drake. Tomatoes, tomatoes. I'm throwing tomatoes at you. Tomatoes. No, I don't like that. You know that I hate that. Also, the whole situation with Tony. There is a reason as to why. Um, that Marvin was searching for Tony and was in that neighborhood and was spying. And I don't know what it connects to, but maybe it is this um, with the situation and them being connected into the whole mob. Because now we know that Tony has money. Remember her wedding was even announced in like the fancy New York Times papers and things. So she has money. Maybe that is a connection to the mob. Maybe her husband is directly connected, is somebody's son, nephew, cousin, best friend, I don't know. But I feel that we, had, remember, Tony wasn't even a thought coming into season two, at least not for me. I thought Tony was like, no, I'm gone, you know, you killed my poodle, haven't I turned into a, a snitch? I've never seen you guys again. But she is back, and she's in that distance, and they brought her back for a reason. So I think she could be that connection to the mob or maybe something else that comes into play with Raquel in this situation. But do not knock down Tony. So those are one of the two things that I wanted to say about that. Yeah, yeah, good point. She, she's definitely, uh, there's definitely some sort of connection. I know Rich said uh, she was in the same area or something as the son. Um, yeah, Scarsdale, uh, yeah. the same neighborhood, so. I don't know because again I did go back and I watched that episode because they showed the guy she was she was she was with but I saw that's not the same actor so that's a completely different guy so I I don't know what the connection is yet but I think we're definitely I think Dana made a good point he could also be a part of the mob and that's how the connection is going to happen but we're, we're definitely going to find out at some point um I feel in the next couple episodes Yeah definitely um 
so yeah great thoughts are uh, all around can't wait to see what they say in the comments we're gonna get to some final thoughts here real quick um before we you know wrap up the show and everything like that so dana any final thoughts for us on this episode you're muted by the way you had me monologuing to myself um <clears throat> one of the things that I really wanted to say is, again, Howard is getting on my nerves. He's too desperate. And he's like, you know, why didn't you call me? I need you. I need you in my life. Come on now. Um, I just don't like that. That is just something. I, I really wonder what Ziza's part is going to be in this and the fact that she didn't flinch. Maybe she's been around this whole situation in terms of, like, people killing people. So she, that just doesn't bother her or the fact that she's so I want to be on top I but again that's not really what I got like I want to be on top no matter what because of the way how jukebox approached her and that she was really shooken up about that she doesn't want to take somebody else's song so I just really wanted to know her thought process as she is watching because I think the whole time she was just sitting there like hey y'all killing each other have fun um so I really wanted to know what her process is with that um also I just like the whole fact that um you, how they just set up everything with Cartier. I really like how he is just slowly, they have him someone is feeding in information that can end up playing a much larger picture in this season and probably in the next season um, of him just, you know, giving her information of how to grow a business and being larger. So while he's not doing much in terms of how he interacts with all of the different characters, he is a vital tool in this and just showing you know, how things may end up going and being successful for the next seasons to follow. So overall, I just thought this was a really good episode. It connected the dots with what we've seen previously and going forward, it gives us something that we can look forward to that is much different than what we've seen in this season and so far and also with the previous season. Um, I just overall, like I said, I love this once again and the writing is nice and good and crisp. And we're getting that tension and that drama that we've always kind of liked from the Power series, except for Force. Yeah, you know, except for Force, indeed. Um, and how about you, Rich? Any final thoughts? Yeah, uh, final thoughts is I, I agree that this was a excellent episode of Raising Canaan. Uh, in my opinion, one of the better episodes so far this season. Uh, because again, it progressed a lot of the storylines and um, it's a turning point. And I want to say whoever is in charge over at Stars, they they uh, they really know how to make people wait because you there will not be another episode of Raising the Canaan again this month. So uh, enjoy this episode. There will not be one on September 25th. Uh, the show will be back after that on October 2nd. But uh, that's why I say enjoy this episode because we're not getting one next week. <laughs> Man, making me sad now because I really want to know what happens next. Like, <laughs> that's a bummer. You know what happens within the next two weeks? You ready? Famous What's interruption it? in his apartment because of the way, the way he treats his apartment and how disgusting it is. He has to <laughs> that's what we're going to say. That's what we're not saying. Yeah. Yeah. I hear about uh, the inspectors don't come around or something. Um, <laughs> But yeah, uh, the show won't be here next week, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out some, some stuff we can do though in the meantime. Um, but yeah, um, let's get a round of shout outs before we head out as well. So Rich, you got any shout outs? Yeah, shout out to everybody that continues to comment as well as listen to the podcast. We always appreciate your uh feedback your comments uh yeah thank you for the continued support um and we do plan to have we have a lot of other things that are coming soon so stay tuned definitely check out all of the great content and interviews that dana has been doing as well and uh stay tuned for some more power because uh we are definitely going to see about having that live stream and we are going to definitely be covering the the other shows as well so stay tuned and thanks again for the continued support Indeed, indeed. Um, Dana, you got any shouts for us? 
no, once again, shout out to everyone who listens to us, um, who tunes in. So thank you. Thank you to all of the newcomers. So thank you for that as well. And also check out the website and check out the uh, YouTube page because we have a lot of interviews. We have a lot of reviews. We did the whole Don't Worry Darling where I had a mental breakdown about how bad it was. Um, and, you know, we have upcoming interviews. If you like this show, we have also coming up, we're going to be touching upon BMF. We have the BMF documentary that is going to be hitting stars very soon. I don't know the month because I don't even know what year I'm in. We have that, but we also have Carl Weber stuff. We have a lot of Carl Weber, um, the family business, and an interview with Carl Weber and with Ernie Hudson. And we also have his new show, uh, Carl Weber Presents Black Hamptons, which is based on his novels, which is actually very good. We have the entire cast of that. If Black China is your tea, we have the tea of Black China too. Got an interview with Black China. That that was a very interesting interview. Um, and there, you know, we have every cup of tea of interviews that you like from different shows. So check out the channel. We will be uploading them daily. So yay. I'm tired. <laughs> oh yeah. Dana's going going crazy right now. She's interviewing everyone, all the celebs. Uh, she's interviewing my favorite Ghostbuster. That's that's incredible. Mm -hmm. And and we also have also Big Sky. We have Marvel. We got She Hulk as well as an interview. So yay, press days. Uh, are you gonna interview Meg Meg The Stallion? Ask her about the twerk. I wish I was there interviewing Meg The Stallion because that episode was like what? And just remember, I seen it months ago. So I'm just waiting for y'all. It's like y'all gonna see this twerk. It's gonna be a whole thing. <laughs> that's hilarious but but yeah definitely check out the channel and the content over there and hit the subscribe button and everything all that good stuff um shout outs to you know the people who chop it up with us every week about power who, you know what regular commenters you know rainy j uh in 71 nigel saps aston necron uh jeremiah lutumba jacob wright uh blatant truth rye one and uh, jo Jordan Bridges, you know, um, had to write down the names to make sure, you know, I got all the pronunciations and everything correct. So, yeah, um, shout outs to all the good people leaving comments and everything like that. We appreciate you all. Um, and yeah, uh, shout outs to Stars also. I, I really like how uh, this, this show is being presented so far. The writing team are doing a, an excellent job of planting seeds and then, you know, delivering on them. Um, so yeah, kudos to two stars. And also, you know, we got the news earlier that uh, BMF uh, season two is coming back in January. So the content cycle is going to be crazy, you know, for, for, for power and stars content, um, you know, because we're going into book two, season three, um, you know, pretty soon. And then BMF in January. And then after that, I assume is force. So uh, yeah, look out for all that. But yeah. Um, that is going to be it for this episode. You know, we will return with, you know, the show as usual um, in, in, in two weeks, you know, the usual show. But don't be surprised if you see some other content, you know, related to power. Also, we're going to, you know, figure out some stuff. Um, but yeah, we'll see you guys soon. Have a great week. Peace out.